Ralph Martin speaks on a crisis of truth, the attack on faith, morality, and mission in the church today. Ralph Martin is an internationally recognized Catholic leader. This is one in a series of five talks on a crisis of truth. There's a link between God's Word and what actually happens in our life. There's a link between the truth of God's Word and how we live our life. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the irreligious and perverse spirit of men who in this perversity of theirs hinder the truth. In fact, whatever can be known about God is clear to them. He himself made it so. Therefore, these men are inexcusable. They certainly had knowledge of God, yet they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. They stultified themselves through speculating to no purpose and their senseless hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but turned into fools instead. As a consequence, God delivered them up in their lust to unclean practices. They engaged in the mutual degradation of their bodies. These men who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Blessed be he forever, amen. I didn't add that, by the way. St. Paul just got excited when he was writing this and just couldn't restrain himself from praising God. Even when he was doing theology, he got excited about Christian truth, about the truth of God's word, and just had to burst out saying, blessed be God forever. Amen. Notice some of the things that are said here. People who know God but reject that revelation, turn away from that revelation of God as it comes to them in creation, in nature, in their own bodies, not to mention his word, get plunged into a spiritual darkness that leads to false worship, that leads to worshiping the creature rather than the creator. As people do this, they think they're making shrewd decisions. They think they're being smart, but they're turning into fools. The tragedy of God's creatures turning away from the magnificent creator to serve and worship creatures rather than the creator, thinking they're smart and wise and shrewd in doing it, not knowing that they're fools the sorry, sad, tragic story of sin. Turning away from the glory of God to serve and worship the creature, plunged into spiritual darkness, turned over to our own wisdom, turned over to our own ideas to live in misery, to degrade our bodies, to be plunged into bondage to immorality, goes on. This is a description of human beings away from God. This is a description of much of what's happening around us today. God therefore delivered them up to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and the men gave up natural intercourse with women and burn with lust for one another. Men did shameful things with men and thus received in their own persons the penalty for the perversity. A lot of the punishment of sin is in the sin. A lot of the punishment for sin is in the sin. God gives us what we choose and the consequences unfold in our life. The wages of sin our death. The wages are always paid. 
they did not see fit to acknowledge God. So God delivered them up to their own depraved sense to do what is unseemly. <coughs> they are filled with every kind of wickedness, maliciousness, greed, ill will, envy, murder, bickering, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips and slanderers. They hate God, are insolent, haughty toward their parents. One sees in them men without conscience, without loyalty, without affection, without pity. They know God's just decree that all who do such things deserve death, yet they not only do them, but approve them in others. One of the consequences of sin is being plunged into spiritual darkness, is losing control of our own desires, thinking we're finding fulfillment and being plunged into slavery to disordered passions, plunged into the very distortion and perversion of what God intended to bring us happiness and peace, plunged into the anguish that comes from living a life apart from God. The punishment for rejecting God's wisdom is being allowed to live according to our wisdom. The punishment of rejecting God's wisdom is being condemned to live according to man's wisdom, which is devilish, which is bitter, which disappoints, which is unreliable. Rejecting God and his word always leads to a distortion of human life. Male and female, he created them. In his own image, he created them. When we reject God and his word, a distortion comes into the very fiber of, 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 of human life. Distortions enter in male and female sexual identity. Sexual confusion enters in. Hatred enters in, self-hatred. Hatred for how God made us. Hatred for our own sexual identity. Confusion, ambiguity. This is happening all around us. As our society increasingly explicitly rejects God, explicitly says we don't want him ruling over us in our courts, in our schools, in our culture, in our entertainment, Increasingly, human life becomes distorted, becomes perverted. That's why the only true humanism is a Christian humanism. The only way of being fully human is to be in Jesus Christ. Only when we're freed from the sin, freed from the tormenting of the evil one, freed from the distorted thinking of the world is our being, is our personality, are our relationships able to stretch out and be how God created us to be. Only by being in Jesus Christ are we able to be fully human. Only by being in Jesus Christ are we able to live a fully human life as God created us to be, male and female. Scripture says sometimes a rejection of God leads to a moral disorder. It also says sometimes an existing moral disorder can lead us to reject God's word. John chapter three, verses 19 and 20. The judgment of condemnation is this. The light came into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were wicked. Everyone who practices evil hates the light. He does, come, he does not come near it for fear his deeds will be exposed. Sometimes we avoid hearing God's word or reject God's word because it calls us to give up something or to make a change in our life or embrace a new way of life or to repent in a way that we'd rather hold on to the darkness that we're nurturing in part of our life. 
moral disorder, moral confusion, particularly in the area of sexuality. It's not the only important area of Christian morality. There's many other important areas. But this is one area that almost everybody is being faced with today in a way that is really undermining and confusing clarity about what God's word is in this area and how it's possible to live it. If this was a problem that only existed in society as a whole and didn't also affect even the church bodies that we're living in, I'd be talking about it in a different way. The tragedy is not just that this is something that's happening amongst non-believers, but this is something that's happening even within God's people. Rejection of his word leading to moral disorder, moral disorder leading to rejection of his word. Until about 1930, the entire Christian tradition and all the Christian churches, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, were in basic agreement about what God's word said in the area of human sexuality and how it needed to be applied to new circumstances. From about 1930 on, there's been a progressive unraveling of Christian teaching in many of the Christian churches. Some Christian churches have actually repudiated God's word and scripture in this area as it's been understood throughout the centuries. Recently, a group of concerned Methodist pastors in Ohio published a white paper, maybe 30 or 40 Methodist pastors, sort of expressing anguish and concern about what was happening within their church. Quote, they, they, they talk about a particular United Methodist Church. It says, this particular United Methodist Church boasts of having the largest sex library in the world. This church, abusing a generous endowment that had been left to the church by committed Christians, actually produced blatantly pornographic training films. These were then made available through our board of discipleship to thousands of people in the last decade. The films explicitly depict lesbian, homosexual, sodomy, group, and oral sexual encounters were often shown to single young adult groups in the church to help them understand their own sexuality and shape, quote, healthy attitudes. They are being used by medical schools all over the world to desensitize prospective doctors. Many objections from within the church have been ignored. As if this were not enough, the gay rights national lobby and the homosexual Metropolitan Community Church had their offices in the United Methodist Building in Washington, D.C. Homosexual and lesbian advocacy is encouraged by our Women's Division of the Board of Global Ministries, the Board of Church and Society, and other United Methodist leaders. Other major Christian churches in this country have moved in a similar direction with a similar moral decay even within church institutions. In the Catholic Church, the problem isn't a change in the official teaching, which is as clear and as firm as it always has been. The problem is, though, increasingly a kind of thinking and approach to God's word that's undermining people's confidence in it and is leading to moral disorder. One example. A few years ago, a group of Catholic theologians published a study called Human Sexuality is published by Paulus Press by a group of Catholic theologians. In it, they basically decided that scripture, tradition, and church teaching were no longer adequate as a guide for moral behavior in the area of sexuality. Now, what we needed to do was to come up with a new set of criteria that would guide uh, moral behavior in this area. They came up with seven criteria which go like this. Sexual behavior needs to be self-liberating, other-enriching, honest, socially responsible, joyous, and so on. The kind of criteria that anybody ever faced with temptation feels is fulfilled in their case. <laughs> the very nature of sexual temptation is that it looks like a pretty positive thing. It looks like it's going to be a joyous experience. When God's word is undermined and we're left to human opinion, it's so easy to find teachers to find us what we want to say, to tell us what we want to hear. When they apply these criteria to particular moral cases, 
the results are just as you might expect. They talk about, for example, whether it's moral for psychologists and psychiatrists who have intercourse with their patients as a way of treating them. Quote, apparently the practice is not uncommon and is defended by some psychiatrists and lay therapists. Officially, the professional societies continue to condemn it for reasons of law. You can still be arrested for this kind of therapy. Public confidence, you could lose some business. And therapy effectiveness, it might not work. <laughs> Quote, the American Psychiatric Association specifically prohibits it. However, the American Psychological Association Code of Ethics does not mention it. And a resolution prohibiting sexual activity with clients failed to pass at the 1975 Convention of the Association. In other words, professional opinions divided, it might be changing, who knows? Then they go on to say, applying the norms adopted in this study, we would have to say that in a hypothetical case where an erotic expression between therapist and patient in fact results in making the patient whole without harm to the other relationship of therapist and patient, such direct involvement of the therapist might be moral. Similar results are achieved when they talk about certain forms of adultery and other kinds of things, and basically leaving the way open for people to do what they please in direct opposition to God's word. I know you might say this is crazy, how could this be? I have to honestly say I don't know. Every one of these authors of the study are still teaching in Catholic seminaries and theological faculties and haven't retracted the opinions put forth in this book. They're forming the priests and religious, ed religious educators of the future. They're forming the people who will be teaching, and already are, our children. Told you about the article in today's Parish Magazine, January 1980. The editorial started off with a ringing call to bisexuality. Later on in the article, there's an article encouraging people to be open to homosexuality, written by a moral theologian teaching at a major Catholic seminary in the United States. Quote, doesn't the church teach that active homosexual persons are sinning? Yes and no. And there it goes. Quote, this part of the church's message rings as true as it ever did and as it always will. Notice already the picking and choosing. This part rings true. You know, different people have different ears. It's, it rings differently for different people. We can't judge it on how it rings. We have to judge it on whether it's God's word or not. But the church also teaches, he says, that sex is for loving. It's for loving in marriage. And nowadays, the church is not so sure that all sex for love outside marriage is sinful. Again, what church is he talking about? those who are trying to change it, to bring it away from God's word, or the church as it teaches faithfully God's word as it's handed on from one generation to another. It goes on to say, surely sex outside of marriage is sinful when new life is likely to be generated. People who play around with sex and then find themselves with an unwanted pregnancy often get abortions. This is the reason the church opposes sex outside marriage, family stability for the security of offspring. It's a good reason. Let's hold on to it, you and I who are the church. Again, the picking and choosing. The distorting. And here's the clincher. But, he says, the problem of getting pregnant and therefore having an abortion is not a problem in sex between two people of the same gender. What about the Bible? The outcry, quote, is culturally conditioned. That's not scholarship. That's propaganda. That's somebody trying to get people to move in a certain direction. You don't write off God's word by saying it's culturally conditioned. Of course it is. God prepared that culture as a fitting vehicle in which to reveal his son Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever how different the kind of thinking that's becoming prevalent today is from God's holy word. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 to 20. Do you not see that your bodies are members of Christ? Would you have me take Christ's members and make them members of a prostitute? God forbid. I didn't add that. St. Paul again, getting excited. Not on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Not yes and no. God forbid. You know, sometimes people today say that uh, everything isn't black and white. That's absolutely true. Everything isn't black and white. But you know what? Everything isn't gray. Some things are black and white. Scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. A little while ago, John Paul II was talking to a group of university students in Rome, and he said, even if they call sin liberation, don't believe them. Call sin, sin. Call what's black, black, and what's white, white. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. 1 Corinthians 6, let's continue. Can you not see that the man who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? Scripture says the two shall become one flesh. Whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun lewd conduct. Don't play around with it. Don't be curious about it. Don't see how far you can go without falling in so deep you'll never get out again. Shun lewd conduct. Don't get near it. Don't touch it. Don't be curious about it. Keep away from it. Every other sin a man commits is outside his body, but the fornicator sins against his own body. You must know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's within. The Spirit you have received from God, you are not your own. You have been purchased and at a price. So glorify God in your body. God's word may be challenging. God's word may be hard. But God's word is true, and it's based on his profound love for every single one of us and his desire for our happiness. Receive the word of God. Probably a lot of us have been exposed to thinking that have weakened our resolve to glorify God in the body, that have confused our thinking and weakened our will when it comes to the Christian teaching on sexual morality. A lot of us have heard things like, well, it's unrealistic to follow the teaching because you can't control your own urges. You've got to do it. How different is God's word? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No test has been sent to you that does not come to all men. Besides, God keeps his promise. He will not let you be tested beyond your strength. Along with the test, he will give you a way out of it so that you may be able to endure it. God will not allow us to be tested beyond our strength. Every fiber in our being may be crying out the opposite. More certain than that is God's word. God will not allow us to be tested beyond our strength, but along with the test gives the grace a way of enduring and a way of coming out of it. God's word is challenging. His gifts are great. His help is close to those who call upon him. Another thing a lot of us have heard is that we need to follow our conscience. That's absolutely true. We need to follow our conscience. But we also need to know that we have a responsibility to form our conscience according to the word of God. Scripture says every thought needs to be brought captive to Jesus Christ. The way we look about things, the way we think about things, the way we feel about things need to be brought into harmony with Jesus. How Jesus looks, how Jesus thinks, how Jesus feels. 
when we're facing difficult circumstances and need to make a judgment about what to do and what's right and what's wrong, we need to be solidly rooted and grounded in God's word so we're in a position to make that judgment. We need to form our conscience according to the word of God. Another thing a lot of us have heard today is that whatever you do, don't feel guilty. Well, certainly it's unpleasant to feel guilty. But sometimes we feel guilty because we are. I don't know if you've considered that. Sometimes people feel guilty because they are. And the solution in that case is not to try desperately to get rid of the feeling, but it's to stop doing the thing that's wrong. That's against God's word and law and against our nature. Now, some of these people today say, oh, you poor thing, you're feeling guilty. Here, let me pray for you for inner healing or let me get you to a counselor so you can work out these feelings. And certainly if our guilt feelings are a result of a neurotic problem, we need whatever help we can, prayer, counseling, to get over them. But if we're feeling guilty because we are, what we need to do is not just get therapy or prayer, but repent. Say, what I'm doing is wrong. How I'm thinking is wrong. How I'm acting is wrong. I need to stop that, admit that to the Lord, ask his forgiveness, ask forgiveness of other people, and, and, and turn to live my life in accordance to God's word. Sometimes we feel guilty because we are. Psalm 32 says, as long as I kept my guilt within me, my body wasted away, my bones burned. But as soon as I confessed my sin to the Lord, I received forgiveness and I was able to praise him again. The right way to take care of guilt when we're guilty is to confess our sin and ask God's forgiveness, to repent and be forgiven. Sometimes we're so focused on motivation that we lose sight of what the objective word of God is in the area that we're concerned about. We've come perhaps to believe that as long as we're sincere, well, everything's okay. Somebody's doing something wrong, you talk to them, you find out, well, oh, you're sincere. Oh, fine, fine. There's a trouble here. Unfortunately, it's possible to sincerely do evil. It's impossible to sincerely ruin another person's life, to sincerely ruin your own life to sincerely commit adultery, to sincerely murder. For all I know, Hitler was sincere. Scripture doesn't cause us to be the judge of our own motives. It calls us to conform our life to the word of God. To take responsibility for when we're not acting in accordance with God's word, to repent and to ask God's help and grace and the help of the brothers and sisters to live according to God's word. It may be a mitigating circumstance that we're sincere. Maybe the fact that my grandmother dropped me on my head when I was a baby kind of takes away some of the culpability when I kick grandmothers, you know? <laughs> Nevertheless, the Lord wants me to stop kicking grandmothers. He understands I have a more difficult time with that because my grandmother dropped me on my head when I was a baby and I've never resolved those feelings. But nevertheless, he wants me to stop kicking my grandmother. There may be reasons contributing to why we're acting wrongly, but the Lord says, put your focus on what you ought to be doing, ask my help to do it, move in that direction and not be so introspective about your motives and feelings and what degree of guilt you have. That's for God to judge. We're called to face his word and respond to it. Sometimes we've heard about how important it is to be compassionate, to be pastoral. Sometimes compassion has come to mean not troubling people with the truth. That's a false compassion. It's not compassionate to lead somebody to believe that the way they're thinking and acting is okay if it's not okay in the eyes of God. In fact, usually what we're concerned about there is not the other person but ourself. A lot of times, false compassion is rooted in self-love, not wanting to go through the pain and suffering of having to communicate the truth of God's word 
when it might not be received. Not wanting to rock the boat in a pleasant social relationship. Not wanting to cause a family problem. Sometimes people today manipulate us into agreeing with what they're doing by giving out subtle signals that they really don't want to know what we think, but they want us to tell them that what they're doing is okay. I don't know if you've experienced things like that. Somebody coming and say, well, of course you understand this, don't you? And you say, well, well of course, of, of course, you know. Sort of manipulating us into assenting to the kind of life they're living, the things they're doing that's against God's word by letting us know in subtle ways that we better not really tell them what we think. True love is rooted in truth. No love, no truth. Truth and love are united in the person of Christ and his word. We need to be gentle. We need to be sensitive. We need to be respectful of the right time and the right place and the right situation. But we need to know that true compassion is, is based in truth. Loving people means loving them enough to communicate to them the truth of God's word, even if a risk is involved, even if pain is involved. It's not loving for a doctor to tell a patient who has cancer that aspirin will do. The wages of sin are death. The only way death can be overcome is through the person, work, and word of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we think, well, gee, maybe we better just be better off being ignorant of God's word. Ignorance is bliss, right? Not really. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. The servant who knew his master's wishes but did not prepare to fulfill them will get a severe beating. Somebody who knew how God wants human beings to live but didn't, didn't live that way is going to be severely punished. The one who did not know them and who nonetheless deserved to be beaten will get off with a lighter beating. Ignorance isn't bliss, it's just simply a lighter punishment. When I first really heard this word, I said, oh, this is a hard word, Lord. This is tough. This is not fair. And then a little light went on. Wait a second, where have I heard that before? Ezekiel. God's people are saying, Lord, your ways are not fair. And then God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel saying, no, 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 you've got it all wrong again. Your ways aren't fair. I said, oh, that's right. When there's a contradiction between me and God, God's right. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to accept this as a word from God, even though I don't understand it, and expect God to unfold understanding to, it, to me in my life. If you live according to my word, you'll be truly my disciples, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I said, here's a chance to test this. Shortly after this, I was driving in Belgium, a little time after I got there, and a policeman pulled me over and said, uh, Monsieur the American, uh, you just broke our traffic law. Uh, you didn't get priority from the right. I said, officer, uh, I'm just a dumb American. I don't know the laws here. You know, you know how these Americans are, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know the law. I, I'm just gotten here a few weeks ago. And the police officer said, mm-mm. When you enter the kingdom of Belgium, Belgium's a kingdom, you have the responsibility to seek out what the rule and law of the land is before you start messing around endangering our life and your life. I said, ah, very interesting. And I felt like the Lord showed me as I went back to scripture that God expects his creatures to seek out his will. God wants the work of his hands to occupy themselves with finding out what the will of the Creator is. God expects us to actively take the initiative in finding out what his will is for human life. Not to do so is to run a risk. John chapter 15, verse 22, Jesus said, If I had not come to them, and spoken to them, 
they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, their sin cannot be excused. God went to a lot of trouble to the point of death on the cross to win for us the Spirit of God and accessibility to the Word of God. Not too many of us on Judgment Day are going to be able to say, I didn't know. God has gone to a lot of trouble that we might know the truth and be set free by it. It's our responsibility to seek out his word that sets us free. Finally, Jesus said, John chapter 16, verse two, a time will come when anyone who puts you to death will claim to be serving God. A time will come, in other words, when Christian truth will be so distorted and perverted that people will do the very opposite of what God intends, calling it serving God. Calling virtue vice, calling vice virtue. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26. Her priests violate my law and profane what is holy to me. They do not teach any longer the difference between the sacred and the profane. They don't teach any longer the difference between the unclean and the clean. I have been profaned in their midst. Some of the examples I talked about are pretty gruesome. If they were just isolated examples, I wouldn't bother to be talking about them. They're examples of a way of thinking and undermining God's word that's becoming very, very prevalent in all the major Christian churches. Our children have been affected by this thinking. You and I have been affected by this thinking. This talk didn't just kind of come out of my my mouth just like that. I, I struggled in my own life to come to this word. I struggled in my own life to really face God's word in this whole area and conform my life to it and ask his help for it. This kind of undermining of God's word is something that's becoming increasingly prevalent and all of us, I believe, have been touched by it in one way or another. As a result, judgment. The wages of sin is death. And unfaithful people experiences disaster. Our society, many of our churches, many of our families are in the process of human disintegration. Things only hold together in Jesus Christ. When God's word has been obscured, when we start worshiping the creature rather than the creator, when spiritual blindness comes upon us, moral disorder follows close behind. And look around, look around. Ezekiel chapter 13, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, false prophets, those who prophesy their own thoughts. Hear the word of the Lord. You did not step into the breach, nor did you build a wall about the house of Israel that would stand firm against attack on the day of the Lord because you have spoken falsely. I am coming at you, says the Lord God. They led my people astray, saying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. I believe people today are being told, go in peace. It's okay when it's not okay. A false peace placed on top of sin. A false purity placed on top of corruption. It's like they built a wall that was corrupt and covered it with whitewash. Say then to the whitewashers, a storm wind shall break out, rain and hailstone shall fall. And when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked, where is the whitewash you spread on? I tell you, there shall be no wall, nor shall there be whitewashes. Those prophets of Israel who prophesied Jerusalem and saw for it visions of peace when there was no peace, says the Lord our God. 
I'd like to close by telling you a story that Father Michael Scanlon, the president of the University of Steubenville, tells on occasion. It's about when he was a little boy. He liked to play outside at night after supper, and his mother said, okay, Mike, you can go play outside after supper, but be home before it gets dark. So Mike would go outside and play, and he'd keep his eye in the sky when the last little ray of light was going down, he'd arrive back on the porch, but his mother would already be out there saying, Mike, Mike, where were you? You're late. Mike would say, no, no, I'm not late. Look, there's the last little gleam of sunlight now. I just went down. Mike would say, well, you couldn't exactly say he was a child of the dark. Not exactly. But you couldn't exactly say he was a child of the light. What he was, as a matter of fact, was a child of the twilight. I think a lot of us have become children of the twilight, have made compromises in our life with God's word, and things are a little murky. I believe God's calling us to commit ourselves to being children of the light, to embracing his word in all its purity and all its power being made clean by the Word of God. It's not easy to live God's Word, but there's no hope unless we admit it is God's Word and embrace it with all our heart. With the help of God, His Holy Spirit, and our brothers and sisters, He'll help us to live it. True compassion is to be patient and merciful with ourselves and others as we attempt to conform our life to the Holy Word of God. Let's, you and I, be children of the light, not of the twilight, and be sons and daughters of the light in a world that's increasingly dark.